The second part of the Bible report tells you to ask at least 10 interpretive questions of each chapter. Some of you may be wondering why we ask questions of the Bible at all. Perhaps you were even brought up in a context where it was considered immoral to question God or the Bible. In case you have entertained such a thought, let me begin with a clarification. First, I'm not asking you to question God or the Bible in the sense of challenging their authority in general or in your life. While that is a decision you'll need to make at some time in your life, that's not what I'm asking you to do in this assignment. You can do this assignment whether you are a devout adherent of the Christian faith and regard the Bible as the Word of God, or you think the Bible is just some ancient book. Second, the point of questioning the text is to understand it. There is no way to understand any text without questioning it. We often fail to recognize this because our questioning comes so automatically that we don't even recognize it as questioning. Let's imagine for a moment that you want to take the text of the Bible just as it is, without any questioning. How do you handle John 1, 1? In our K, ein hologos, kai hologos ein pros ton theon, kai theos ein hologos. What do you make of that? That's the verse as it was originally written, in Greek. My guess is that most of you neither read nor speak Greek. To you, this verse as it stands means nothing. You need to ask the question, what does that mean in English? Chances are that you almost never have to ask that question when you encounter the Bible because you encounter the text in a format where others, in this case the translators, have already asked the question for you. Because they've asked, how can this Greek text be rendered in English, you have the luxury of assuming you have the pure text with no questions. When we approach the Bible, we can take translation as the first layer of interpretation. Until you learn Greek and Hebrew well, you will be stuck with dealing with at least a minimally interpreted text. Some of you may be doubtful that we're supposed to understand the Bible. It's ancient. It's in another language. It's the Word of God. It has power in itself, whether we understand it or not. Do you know what we could call this approach? Magic. The Bible is treated as a magical object or talisman. Is that what we see when we read the text, however? When I read the Bible, I see the Word of God coming to people in such a way that it addresses them and calls for a response. A response requires at least a minimal level of understanding. Because of this, I am presupposing that understanding the Bible is a good thing. If, then, we wish to understand the Bible, we need to ask questions of what it says. Since I've already mentioned John 1.1, 1, 1, let's start right there. I'm looking for interpretive questions, not simple factual questions. By factual, I mean a question that can be easily answered simply by looking at the text. Here are some simple factual questions we could ask about John 1.1. 1, 1. What is the first word of the verse? What was in the beginning? Who was the word with? Notice that each of these questions is easily answered simply by looking at the text. I don't want questions like these. If these are factual questions, what are interpretive questions? Here are some I would ask of this verse. When John speaks of the beginning, what does he have in mind? The beginning of creation? The beginning of the story of Jesus? From before time itself came into being? What is meant by the word? Why does John use this terminology? What does it mean to be with God? In what way was the word God? How can the word be with God and be God at the same time? Was John intentional in starting his gospel the same way as the book of Genesis? If so, why? Notice that these questions cannot be answered simply by looking at the text. In fact, you might not even know how to go about answering these questions. That's perfectly fine. Answering the questions is not part of the assignment. All you have to do is ask the questions. There's nothing wrong with factual questions. Factual questions address the issue of what the text says. Interpretive questions take for granted what the text says and push farther. They ask, what does the text mean? What should we do with it? There are some interpretive questions I don't want you to ask. These are questions that show no or only minimal engagement with the text. An example I've seen many times is something like, What does John mean in verse 1? 
Now, this is an interpretive question. It cannot be read simply off the face of the text. It shows no engagement with the text, however. All it tells me is that you know there's a verse 1. Let's consider another text. Luke chapter 2. Take a moment and turn to it now. Verse 1 starts like this. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. In a text like this, it's easy to see simple, factual questions of the sort I don't want you to ask. Questions like, who issued a decree, or who was governor of Syria at that time, can be simply read off the text. Don't ask questions like that. Here are some interpretive questions one could ask. Why did Caesar want to take a census? Was this something he did regularly? What was the extent of the entire Roman world? Why is the governorship of Quirinius mentioned? How is this an important detail? What kind of information was sought in the census? What would the Romans do with the information? What does it mean for a person to have his own town? How was one's own town reckoned? Why did people have to go to their own town? Do you notice how many why and how questions there are? The what questions inquire into the historical background and cultural context. These kinds of questions are signs that we're dealing with interpretive issues. Let's consider another passage. Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him. When Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear him and be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Here are interpretive questions I would ask of this text. What is leprosy? Is the disease called leprosy in the Bible the same disease we today call leprosy? Why did the man think Jesus could make him clean? Why is healing from leprosy spoken of in terms of cleanness? Why does the man fall on his face to the ground to ask this question? Why doesn't he just walk up to Jesus and talk like a normal person? Did the man expect Jesus to be willing to heal him? What prior experience or knowledge did he have of Jesus that led him to think Jesus would be able and willing? Why did Jesus touch the man? Could Jesus have healed the man without touching him? How would those around Jesus have understood what they saw, given their understanding that uncleanness was associated with leprosy and its transmission to others? How did Jesus keep from becoming unclean? To what degree was Jesus a social deviant or rebel in his act of touching the leper? Why did Jesus command the man to go to the priest? What did Moses command in this context? Why is what Moses said relevant? Why did Jesus command the man not to tell anyone, but to settle for just showing himself to the priest? Did the man actually make it to the priest? Was there a priest available locally, or did he have to make a long trip, perhaps as far as Jerusalem, to fulfill Jesus' command? If the man obeyed Jesus, how did so many find out what happened? Why did Jesus so often withdraw to lonely places to pray? Why did he not spend all his time capitalizing on his ministry successes? What is the connection between Jesus' time in prayer and his ability to heal? You may notice I've just suggested 14 questions for a mere five verses. I realize that when you're starting out, the questions might not flow as easily as they do for me. I do hope you notice something, however. The questions are there to be found. Let me back up a moment. Maybe I shouldn't speak of questions being there to be found, since it implies there is a particular set of questions lying behind the text just waiting for you. That is not the case. What I'm trying to say is that if I want to understand a text, there are many things I can inquire about. 
the questions that occur to me will likely not be exactly the same questions that occur to you. We have different backgrounds. We have different experiences with the text in the past. I've read the whole Bible many times. I've been studying and teaching the text for decades. For these reasons, some of the questions will occur to me that won't occur to you. That doesn't mean, however, that I have all the questions there are. I expect many of you will have questions that have never occurred to me. They occur to you because of your life experience and your own history with the text, or lack thereof. I assume I can learn much from the questions you ask.